Okay, good morning. Uh, so I was tasked to talk on uh, SARS-CoV-2, its variants and vaccines, no? but I decided to also discuss a little on the disease uh, that is caused by the SARS-CoV-2 itself, no? which presents in many different uh, manifestations in pa uh, patients. So I type, entitled the topic as vagaries, variants, and vaccines. So as we all know, COVID-19 or the coronavirus uh, infectious disease is caused by SARS-CoV-2, which is a newly uh, emergent coronavirus, which was first uh, recognized in Wuhan, China in December of 2019. And as of uh, February 28, 2021, there have been about 115,000 cases, and the number of deaths is at 2,540. So transmission is, um, wait, I'll just, there. Okay. So transmission is uh, from person to person through respiratory droplets, which is generated by exhaling, especially when it's done vigorously, sneezing, coughing, singing, and speaking. And the relative contributing role of aerosols is still unclear, but is much less important. And indirect transmission through fomites that have been contaminated by respiratory secretions is also possible. That's why it is recommended that we wash our hands and that we wear our masks. So viral shedding is um, identified in the respiratory specimen, no? uh, even one or two days before the onset of symptoms. And we call this uh, pre-symptomatic uh, viral shedding. And it can persist up to eight days in mild cases and even longer for uh, those with severe and critical cases. And they said that it's, it can shed, be shed up to 20 days from the onset of symptoms. So the incubation period is the period from the time that the patient uh, acquires the virus until the time that the manifestation is uh, noted. The mean media uh, incubation period is five days, but 97.5% of those who will develop symptoms occur within 11.5 days. That's the reason why uh, the, in, uh, the quarantine period for patients who are exposed to the virus is uh, set at 14 days so that we can observe because sometimes the, the symptom may set in on the 10th day or in the 11th day. So there are three stages of the infection. And the first stage is the early infection, which is marked by a viral response. So it may be uh, manifested as fever, dry cough, mild constitutional symptoms. And most patients are actually all, only have this uh, stage of the infection. But some will proceed to the next stage, which is uh, the pulmonary stage. And it is associated with shortness of breath with or without hypoxia or decrease in the oxygen saturation in the blood. And then even a smaller set of pace, subset of patients also proceed to the hyperinflammation uh, phase, which is associated with uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, shock or drop in the blood pressure, and respiratory failure. Uh, the disease is classified into mild or asymptomatic, moderate, severe, and critical. So we usually classify our patients in the hospital with these uh, disease classifications. And this is also uh, where the uh, field health uh, gives their coverage for uh, those who are hospitalized based on this classification. About 10 to 20% of symptomatic infected individuals develop more severe disease. You know? So that's only about 10 to 20% of those who are infected. And 2% of those infected will succumb to death. Diagnosis, apart from uh, having the di clinical diagnosis, of course, it is uh, confirmed by RT-PCR. No, where the patient is swabbed and then this is sent to the laboratory for detection of the uh, antigen by RT-PCR. The recently released rapid antigen test can also be used you know, uh, as a diagnostic tool for patients. 
So in the latest guideline, it was said that uh, patients who have symptoms um, that is consistent with uh, coronavirus disease plus a rapid antigen test, it is also uh, considered to be confirmed to have uh, COVID-19. So treatment is mainly supportive. You know? So patients can be given paracetamol for the fever, uh, mucolytics for the cough, and uh, for if patient have colds, then the congestant, or but if patient manifests with body aches, then they may be given analgesics. So antivirals are also given, especially those who are hospitalized. You know? So we have the remdesivir, which is the IV uh, antiviral, and the favipiravir, which is the tablet form. We also give steroids for patients because of the inflammatory response that the body uh, has against the virus. And in, to some extent, the inflammatory response is really great. So we try to uh, uh, control their inflammatory response by the use of the steroid. And there's also another drug, which is the tocilizumab, which we give for those uh, who have uh, severe infections. And once we see that the patient may manifest a beginning cytokine storm, then we give this drug. So we only give this for those subset of patients because it's, a, it's an expensive drug. So it costs about uh, 28,000 per dose. And then we also give low molecular weight heparin for, because patients are, uh, have the tendency to form clots in the blood. So we give these to patients. And there's also hemoperfusion where uh, the, the same machine as the dialysis machine is being used, but a different cartridge is uh, used. And the purpose is to really filter the uh, inflammatory mediators that is released by the body during the infection. Convalescent plasma has also been used, but studies have not really been very uh, conclusive about its benefit in patients where the uh, COVID infection. So uh, recently, NMMC has already started um, extracting blood to those who have recovered from um, the infection. And then we also have the extracorporeal membrane oxygen uh, therapy, which is actually not available in Cagayan yet, but it is also an option for those with critical infections. So this is a picture no, of a patient who has recovered from the, in, the disease. No? And then so we asked, so unlike in other in, uh, diseases or infections where when the patient is noted to have improved and can be sent home, then they are immediately sent home to their, to their places. But it's different with COVID because um, once the patient has recovered, they still have to comply the number of days that the patient has to be isolated and then we send them home. So it's either we send them home if they have complied the number of days required for isolation in the hospital or we send them to that uh, treatment and monitoring facility to complete their isolation there. So we asked you know, when can patient be sent home really those who are diagnosed with COVID and is there a need to repeat the swab because this is a common question that patients ask us uh, when they are well already and can be sent home. So this, will, this slide will show you the Omnibus Interim Guidelines on Prevention, Detection, Isolation, Treatment, and Reintegration Strategies for COVID, which was released uh, in October of last year no, by the Department of Health. So it says the discharge criteria for suspect, probable, and confirmed COVID-19 cases shall no longer entail repeat testing. Now, repeat testing should not be a prerequisite for the issuance of a clearance or certification to be issued by medical doctors. The reason for this is that uh, studies have shown that uh, even if the virus can be detected by RT-PCR, even two weeks or even three weeks after uh, the onset of infection and the patient has been clinically well for several days, two weeks already, some patients' RT-PCR result will still come out positive. But there was a study which um, 
did an RT-PCR and viral culture at the same time, and they were able to show that the culture, the virus can be cultured actually up to the six to eight days of the, from the onset of illness. Beyond that, they cannot culture the virus anymore. So it means that uh, the RT-PCR positivity result just detected the antigen, but not the live virus actually. So patients with mild symptoms who have completed at least 10 days of isolation from the onset of illness, either at home or a temporary treatment and monitoring facility, and in, this is inclusive of three days of being clinically recovered and asymptomatic, can be discharged and reintegrated to the community without the need for further testing, provided that a licensed medical doctor clears the patient. For patients with moderate, severe, or critical symptoms who have completed at least 21 days of isolation in the hospital from the onset of illness, inclusive of three days of being clinically recovered, and asymptomatic can be discharged and reintegrated to the community without the need for further testing, provided that, again, a licensed medical doctor clears the patient. So for those who have uh, been swabbed, but they have been asymptomatic and whose RT-PCR result turned out positive and remained asymptomatic for at least 10 days from the onset of specimen collection can discontinue isolation after 10 days and be tagged as recovered, confirmed case without need for further testing, provided that a licensed medical doctor certifies or clears the patient. So this is actually really very clear in the omnibus guideline, but unfortunately, uh, there's still a lot of confusion in the, in the community because many patients really also want to be tested still. You know? So because they want to be assured that they are really negative and then many patients needs to stay also in the different uh, facilities and they cannot uh, be sent to their uh, homes because of this uh, fear. So an update taken from the Centers of Disease Control uh, said that the concentrations of SARS-CoV-2 RNA in the upper respiratory specimens decline actually from the after the onset of symptoms. So starting on the first day that the uh, symptom sets in, then slowly in the next few days, the viral shedding declines. And the likelihood of recovering replication competent virus also declines after the on onset of symptoms. So for patients with mild to moderate COVID-19, replication competent virus has not been recovered after 10 days following symptom onset. And the recovery of replication competent virus, meaning a live virus between 10 to 20 days after symptom onset has been reported in some adults with severe COVID-19, only with severe COVID-19 or those with critical COVID-19. So in this series of patients, it was estimated that 88% and 95% of their specimens no longer yielded replication competent virus no, or live virus after 10 and 15 days respectively following onset of symptoms. So that it's really uh, uh, okay to send the patient home because we know that uh, patients' uh, viral shedding really declines uh, after the onset of symptoms. So by the 10th day, most likely the patient is really no longer infectious. And in a large contact tracing study, no contacts at high risk of exposure develop infection if their exposure to a case patient started six days or more after the case patient's infection onset. So that means if you have been exposed no, to a patient after a week of, from the onset of illness, no, in these studies where they con there was contact tracing of these contacts, they have seen that there was no secondary infection to those who were exposed six days after the onset of symptom in the index cases. So recovered patients can continue to have SARS-CoV-2 RNA uh, detected in their upper respiratory specimens for up to 12 weeks after symptom onset. 
an investigation of 285 persistently positive adults, which included 126 adults who have developed recurrent symptoms, found no secondary infections no, among, among 790 contacts of these 285 persistently positive adult uh, patients. So the CDC recommends that all people, regardless of symptoms and regardless of whether or not they have had laboratory confirmed COVID-19 in the past, continue to use all recommended prevention strategies to prevent SARS-CoV-2 transmission, which is actually wearing your mask, uh, social distancing, and uh, avoiding crowds and washing hands regularly. So we have what we call the post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection because we have, I'm sure some of us have read that there are patients who still manifest symptoms weeks or even months after uh, they have had the infection. And this can be manifested as fatigue, shortness of breath, cough, joint pain, chest pain, and other patients they may manifest as having difficulty with thinking and concentration. Some will have muscle pains, irritations, and these can last for weeks to months. And this is more commonly seen in females. And it was initially thought that this is seen in the elderly age groups, but recent studies have shown that it's also seen in young individuals in the, 30, in the third to fourth decades of their lives. So we also have, heard, uh, have heard of the variants now of SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. And so what are these? No? So viruses constantly change uh, through mutation. Mutation rate is the rate at which errors are made during the replication of the viral uh, genetic material. And mutation rates are clearly subject to natural selection and can evolve over time. So all RNA virus to which the SARS-CoV-2 belongs mutate over time some more than the others. And many viruses have high rates of evolution due to large population of the viruses, the short generation times of the virus, and the high mutation rates of this group of viruses. So this slide will show you the, uh, and this is an illustration you know, of how the virus will mutate. You know? So you will, you have a virus there you know, in you, you, uh, see the left uh, side of the, the illustration, and you will see that there are two viruses here, you know, the one with the red genetic uh, material and the other is the, with the blue genetic material. So both of these viruses can infect the host cell. You know? So this is the host cell. So the virus will make use of the machinery of the host cell to replicate its genetic material. So they will make use of the RNA polymerase so the genetic material is replicated, so you will have two genetic materials here. But the RNA polymerase may also have errors in detecting the end signal of the replication. So they may, here, the RNA polymerase is still attached to the uh, genetic material of the virus with the red genome, and then it attaches also to the uh, genetic material of the virus with the blue genome. And then it mixes the genetic material and then it, sends, uh, it senses uh, the end uh, signal for replication. So as a result, you may have a genetic material, which is a hybrid of the one with the red and the blue genetic um, material. And you also have a virus which is the original genetic material. So you will have viruses here with the red genome and the blue genome, and you have a mutated virus there. So that's how the virus uh, mutates. So I think we, I will only discuss, the, the others are for the, the different kinds of virus, but uh, we will just focus on the uh, non-segmented RNA virus. So, 
SARS-CoV-2 variants is an is variant is a new virus variant that has one or more mutations that differentiate it from the wild type or the predominant virus variants already circulating among the general population. So there have been a few identified, the B117 in the UK, the B1351 in South Africa, the P1 in Brazil, and the P521 in New York, no, which is similar to the South African variant. And currently, there is no evidence that mutations have any effect on the, the disease severity, but possibly on the infectivity of the virus. Uh, some, they said the UK vi variant uh, may be more infectious compared to the wild type uh, virus. So this will just uh, this table will show you the different variants, you know, their mutations, where they were first identified, and then whether they uh, confer increased transmissibility. You know? So for the UK, it uh, was confirmed to be more infectious compared to the wild type, and for the um, uh, South African. There is uh, evidence that suggests that some mutations may affect it also its transmissibility. So the impact on severity of disease or vaccine efficacy, there is no evidence for the for most of the variants. But for the uh, South African, there is evidence that suggests that some mutations may affect its antigenic profile, which may affect the ability of antibodies to recognize or neutralize the virus. So what are the potential consequences of emerging variants? No? So it may have an effect on the ability to spread more quickly in people. So there is evidence that the 614G variant spreads more quickly than viruses without the mutation. And it may also have an effect on the ability to cause either milder or more severe disease in people. So it was noted that there's an increased risk of death in the UK variant. And there's also the uh, effect on the ability to evade detection by specific viral diagnostic tests. But um, studies have shown that the recent test can still detect these different variants uh, that uh, has been identified in the different places. And there is also effect on the uh, decreased susceptibility to therapeutic agents such as uh, monoclonal antibodies because these antibodies were supposed to be um, manufactured to detect specific uh, antigen of the virus. But so if there's a change in the viral antigen, so there is a potential that this might, be, um, this might not be detected by these monoclonal antibodies. And there's also effect on the ability to evade natural or vaccine-induced immunity. The virus would likely need to accumulate multiple mutations in the spike protein because this is really the target of our immune system, the spike protein of the virus, to evade immunity induced by vaccines or natural selection uh, infection. So um, currently, there's still really no uh, the studies have not shown that there is really a need to change the vaccine so to be able to uh, target these uh, new variants because they have seen that it's still effective against uh, these new variants that have been identified. I think that's the last slide for the first set. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Doc Arlene Obshoma. Uh, we will have you again after our second resource person will be able to share uh, her inputs as well uh, for this morning's webinar. So, Dr. Arlene, <laughs> thank you very much for your first presentation. We look forward to the next part of your presentation. So, please stay on. Uh, thank you. There are questions that are already uh, raised here uh, in our chat box, other than, of course, what had been uh, raised in the pre-registration link. So again, uh, we will have an open forum after all the inputs are um, shared. So if we can hold on to these questions until after the presentation. So thank you very much. So again, Dr. Arlene, thank you very much for your first presentation. Can we give Dr. Arlene a round of virtual applause, please? Thank you very much. Sige. So let us proceed. 
Our uh, second topic uh, uh, is entitled Herd Immunity, Understanding the Science of Ending the COVID-19 Pandemic. Our second resource person is a medical doctor by training. In fact, she doesn't need an introduction because she's one of our own. Uh, so she is an associate professor in the Department of Preventive Preventive Family and Community Medicine uh, in our own Jose Pirisal College uh, School of Medicine. Uh, she teaches epidemiology and research methods. Uh, concurrently, uh, she is also the director of um, the Center for Global Health, an outreach unit of the School of Medicine. And she also works with the Northern Mindanao Medical Center uh, as the institutional research coordinator and as the chair of the research ethic boards, ethic, ethics board. As a public health expert um, in the region, um, she is involved in many research and development projects uh, on water, sanitation, and hygiene, on child nutrition, disaster management, public health policy, biosafety, and biosecurity. Uh, we will not make this long. She does not need a uh, kind of long introduction again. She is our friend. She is our colleague. Uh, please let us all welcome our very own Dr. Gina Itchon. Good morning. Our round uh, of virtual applause, please. Can, can we stop share the slide for, yeah. Yeah. for Doc? Doc Arlene, can you okay. end a uh, slide share, please, so that Doc Gina can also uh, share her screen? Understood. Good morning. Okay. okay. I hope you can see the slide now. The slides now. Not yet. Not yet. Yes. Yes. Nana do. Okay. So there you go. Uh, so this was my task, no? Ah, uh, gamay lang a correction kang Gail. Uh, professor na ko karon no na na promote na ko. <laughs> okay. Na promote na I was promoted in December so very new. So one of the terms that that you hear very very often in media is herd immunity no and uh, that was my task. I was tasked to discuss this what is this no because this is actually our hope for ending this COVID-19 pandemic. So I will basically take up this, this uh, topics, review of the COVID-19 timeline, which Dr. Arlene also did, no? And then how infections propagate, how infections end, and a little bit about vaccine hesitancy, because this is actually our biggest barrier now to achieving herd immunity. So, um, very quickly, no. This is the this was the start of the pandemic last year when nobody wanted to believe what WHO was saying. Um, in a period of of two months, actually, no. So from December 2019 to January 2020, the the infection spread very fast all over the world. And this uh, this slide shows how the countries were affected no? by January 20. There were only four countries affected with the, with the disease. By February 15, there were 28, including the Philippines. By March 1, two weeks after, there were 66. And by March 20, it was all over the world. No? It was very difficult to find an area that was not affected with COVID-19. So. That is how we are now, no? And fast forward to a year after this is this is the um, coronavirus resource center of Johns Hopkins. I accessed last Sunday when I was doing my slides, uh, February 27. So a year after this is how we are, no? Uh, global cases are about 113 or 114 million, and our deaths are in the Two million, no? two million plus. And again, the map says the map shows everything, all, all the areas being almost all the geographical geographical areas being impacted by this disease. So, how do infections spread? No, in general, how do they they spread? Uh, 
Uh, okay, this was again, Dr. Arlene referred to this. So we have general transmission. You can have the, the disease agent coming from, this, com, coming from the environmental air, areas from the environment. So you can have wind dire directly from the wind and directly from the water impacting people, no? Or it can pass through animal vectors. So as in the case of malaria and dengue, which passes through mosquitoes or bubonic plague, which passes through fleas. But then the more common uh, mode of transmission is actually human to human transmission, no? So we have direct contact where the pathogen has to be introduced directly from one person to another. No? HIV is like this. It's introduced by sex or by, by uh, needles, needle stick. No? And then we have indirect contact where the pathogen is survives the environment no and uh, this is where fomites come in no so you can you can get the infectious agent through doorknobs through light switches etc etc and then droplets no where the pathogens are in respiratory droplets but they do not survive long and then airborne when the pathogens are aerosolized and stay infective for more more time no and then fecal oral or when the, the agent is passed through water or through food. So for COVID-19, uh, it is thought that indirect contact droplets and airborne play a role, although these are not really very clear yet which ones are, which one really plays a big role. No? So that's why we are we are told to wash our hands, we're told to wear a mask, we're told to wear a face shield even, no? to, because we're trying to address all of these um, methods of transmission. So an infection propagates itself by transferring to other susceptible hosts. That's, that's how it spreads no? from one host to another. And susceptible hosts are those who are easily infected, having no or not enough immunity to fight off the infection. Now for COVID-19, all human beings were susceptible in the beginning of the pandemic, since we were dealing with a new disease. So nobody had immunity at all in the beginning, uh, uh, last year. No? People who have been infected with COVID-19 form antibodies against the disease. And getting infected is one way of developing immunity to an infectious disease. So one year, ah, one year ago, we did not know that there would be vaccines that were going to be developed. So the only way really that you would get that you had you had hope of developing antibodies is when you get the disease itself no and it was very tempting to think this no with covid-19 can we wait for people to just get infected so that they develop the antibodies for protection so that's what people were saying no that uh, let everybody get covid-19 so that they will develop the antibodies and then uh, they will be and and we can control the infection that was that was a very tempting um, thing to, to think about, no? But my, if we did this, if we did this, at what cost, no? We can wait for people to get infected, but then people will die. No? And uh, the mortality rate was, was uh, very high in the beginning of this infection because even as doctors, we did not know what to do. We did not know how to manage the pe persons with, with the disease. So, so, however, we have a choice. No? Once the vaccines were developed, immunizing people is another way of making more people develop antibodies. This is faster and safer because antibodies for protection are developed without experiencing the full-blown disease. 
So you develop the antibodies, but you don't experience the full-blown disease. And so it's safer. You don't die. No? How many people do we need to vaccinate? So that's, uh, again, that, that is a question. If we vaccinate, how many people do we need to vaccinate? And that's where her, once we start talking of herd immunity, that's actually a sign that the end of the pandemic or the epidemic is near. So herd immunity is, or, or community immunity, no? is a form of indirect protection from infectious disease that can occur when a sufficient percentage of a population has become immune to an infection, whether through vaccination or previous infections, thereby reducing the likelihood of infection for individuals who lack immunity. Now, this percentage is determined scientifically and involves the use of the R0 or the transmissibility factor. No? For COVID-19, this has been determined to be around 70% of the population based on the R0 of 2 to 3. Uh, if you have an R0 of 2 to 3, meaning one infected person is capable of tran transmitting the disease to two to three other new susceptibles. No? So that's the R0. And it's actually very simple. No? If you have no, if you have a population with no herd immunity, there are no immune individuals. It is easy, it is very easy to pass on the infection to others. So if there is no, there, there are no people who are immune. If enough people get sick and survive or enough people get immunized, then you achieve herd immunity. Each of these green guys are actually barriers to the disease. The, the virus or the bacteria finds it more difficult to find another susceptible because there are more people who are immune. No? So that's, that's what herd immunity is. Very simple. Oh, another picture. If only people, if only a few people are vaccinated, so you have a whole lot of susceptibles, the, the ones who are colored gray. If you have one infected person, it is so easy to pass on the infection to others because there are few people who are immunized and who cannot get the disease. But if lots of people are vaccinated, so you have one infected person in orange, and it will be more difficult for that disease agent to be passed on to another susceptible individual. Then the disease can spread very far and the whole community stays safe. That is what herd immunity is. No? So in other words, if we, if we get ourselves immunized, we are actually protecting also other people in other, other susceptibles in the community. So this, this was, uh, this is from Bloomberg, no? And this was when uh, we did not yet know enough about the disease. So a novel pathogen is introduced to the community and because it's new, no one has immunity and it begins to spread. This was how COVID-19 was in the beginning. Those who recover and those who receive a vaccine, if there is one, develop immunity, at least for a period of time. With the coronavirus, it's not known how long. Even up to now, we don't know. If we get the vaccine, do we have to get it every year? Do we have to get it every two years? Do we have to get it every five years? We do not know. So far, there is no proof. Well, when this was written, there is no proven vaccine. Not right now, there are quite a number of, of proven vaccines. Herd immunity takes hold when the pathogen can find new hosts and stop spreading. That happens once a sufficient portion of the community is immune. And for this virus, it is estimated between 55 and 82 percent. At this time, they really were not very sure yet. No, this was around August of last year. Right now, we can we can say it with more more uh, 
specificity and it's actually between 65 and 75 percent. If enough people are immune to a certain disease, every immune individual acts as a barrier to the transmission of disease. And an epidemic or a pandemic ends when the causative agent could no longer transfer to a susceptible individual and it dies out. No? Wala na siya mabalhinan, so it will die. The only actually barrier to achieving herd immunity is when there are not enough immune individuals. No? If, for example, many refuse the vaccine or heaven forbid, the vaccine we receive is spoiled. So we do not want that, no? So what is vaccine hesitancy? We, I tried to look into the reasons, no, into a study, why people would not want to receive COVID-19 vaccination. This is what I found. This is from the US Department of Health and Human Services, no? which is the counterpart of the DOH in the US. And it's interesting what the reasons are. You know? This is as of December, 2020, so quite new. Uh, so the top reason why people do not want to receive the vaccine is they're worried about possible side effects. So that's 59%. They do not trust the government to make sure the vaccine is safe and effective, 55%. And the vaccine is too new and want to, and they want to wait and see how it works for other people. That's 53%. And 51%, thanks to President Trump, politics has played too much of a role in the vaccine development process. So those are the top four no, that comprises more than 50% of uh, respondents answering, answering these choices. Um, it would be interesting how it will be in the Philippines if we conducted a similar study. No? So what is my takeaway message? As members of a university community, it is our responsibility to educate others about vaccination. And really, it is our moral responsibility no? to be vaccinated. We must contribute to Cagayan de Oro achieving herd immunity by having ourselves immunized. So I'd like to end with this slide. This is from Dr. Volberding, who is a faculty member of the UC San Francisco School of Medicine. Very simple man ang yang isulti, no? I'd much rather have a vaccine than have the virus. So very practical. And that's my topic. Thank you very much for your attention and your time. Thank you very much, uh, Doc Gina, for um, that very informative no, and very substantive um, input on herd immunity and the importance of really getting vaccinated. So it is not actually just in the US, maybe, Doc Gina, that the side effects is the leading reason for the apprehensions of people to subject themselves to vaccination. Okay, in our <laughs> generated um, answers here no, from our participants today, it's also the, the, you know, the question on the, the vaccine and the vaccination, uh, subjecting oneself to vaccination as uh, among the, the reasons here for answering maybe to, to uh, subjecting oneself to vaccination. Sige. So thank you, Dr. Gina. Please stay on for the open forum after uh, the second presentation of Dr. Arlene. So thank you very much. Can we give Dr. Yeah. Gina a virtual round of applause, please? So thank you very much. At this point, let us call back again uh, Doc Arlene uh, of Shoma to present to us the available vaccine, available vaccines that are in the market. But although it's it's still scarce at this point, let us try to see what are available and uh, what are the recommended ones, at least for us. <laughs> uh, what the, the doctors really recommend for us. Sige. So thank you very much, Doc Arlene. It's it's your turn now. Yes. Thank you. Can you see my slides now? Yes. Yes, Doc. 
So now we go to the different COVID-19 vaccines. So <clears throat> we asked the question first. No? So this was partly discussed by Dr. Gina already. So vaccines greatly reduce the risk of infection by training the immune system to recognize and fight pathogens such as viruses or bacteria. And vaccines safely deliver an immunogen, which is a specific type of antigen that elicits an immune response to train the immune system to recognize the pathogen when it is encountered naturally. So we have mentioned earlier, so why do we need vaccines? Because there are a lot of uh, individuals infected already and we have already had a lot of people dying from uh, disease. So we really need to stop this uh, infection and this pandemic. And that is really mainly through the uh, administration of vaccines. So vaccines can prevent infectious diseases. Example of vaccine preventable diseases are the measles, polio, hepatitis, influenza. So we have all these vaccines and probably many of us have had these uh, immunizations already. And when, when most people in a community are vaccinated against the disease, then the ability of the pathogen to spread is limited. This was mentioned by Dr. Regina. And when many people have immunity, this also indirectly protects people who cannot be vaccinated, such as the very young babies and those who have compromised immune systems. So how are vaccines made? There are three main approaches to making a vaccine. No? So first is uh, using the whole virus or the uh, bacterium. And then there's also the second, which uh, uses the uh, parts of the virus. And for the uh, SARS-CoV vaccine, they make use of the spike protein. No? So that's the, is the one that triggers the immune system. And other uh, vaccines also make use of the genetic material of the virus. So using the whole microbe approach, we also have the inactivated vaccine no, where the virus is subjected to chemical exposures that inactivates the virus and then they administer it uh, through the vaccine. We also have the live attenuated. So this is uh, the live virus is injected, but it is uh, made uh, weakened or attenuated so that it will not cause uh, the disease that the virus uh, causes. And then we also have the viral vector vaccine. No? So they make use of another uh, virus that is not able to multiply. And then so they put the genetic material into that virus and then they use that for the vaccine. So the subunit approach, uh, as we have mentioned, uses the spike protein and it only uses the very specific parts of a virus or bacterium that the immune system needs to recognize. And then we have the genetic approach, which includes your mRNA and the DNA vaccines. So this is the life cycle of the vaccine. No? So uh, we have to remember that safety is always a priority during the vaccine development and approval. So uh, in the beginning, when uh, in the labor different companies, uh, the laboratory would search for uh, about the disease, what can be done to uh, contain the spread of the disease. And then when they discover an antigen that can potentially stop or uh, stimulate the immune system of the uh, individuals to be able to fight the infection, then they uh, do clinical, preclinical studies of this vaccine. So they test it on animals. So when they see that uh, there is no adverse, uh, severe adverse reactions in animals, then the company then submits their uh, investigational new drug application to food, uh, FDA, Food and Drug Administration. So the FDA rigorously reviews the um, materials that were submitted to them to see and to ensure that uh, the vaccine the, uh, that is being applied for is really safe for, for use. And so when it is approved, then it is uh, subjected to the phase one trial. 
So the phase one trial, this is tested to healthy individuals. So about 20 to 100 individuals are being tested uh, using the vaccine. And when they see that there is no uh, reaction you know, in, the, in the trial, then they will proceed to the phase two trial, which will assess more of the effectiveness of the vaccine. So they will look into the immune response of the different individuals to which, uh, to whom these vaccines are administered, and then they measure the antibody response and even measure, see if these uh, individuals will develop uh, infections when they are subjected to uh, the virus. And then when this is already, uh, when this is completed, then they proceed to the phase three trial, which also assess the safety and effectiveness. So this is done in a greater number of people, uh, hundreds uh, of thousands of individuals. So this may include now the vulnerable individuals because in the phase one, this is only done in the healthy individuals. So for the phase two, some selected uh, vulnerable groups may be included. And in, in the phase three trial, uh, all uh, groups of or subsets of individuals are represented. And so, so they will know if this is really effective for all uh, subgroups of people. So when they are uh, done with the phase three trial and they see that there is the, the uh, vaccine is really effective and safe, then they will, the FDA will uh, again uh, review the uh, information uh, when the company submits the biologics license application to FDA. So the FDA will review and then after a rigorous review of the document submitted, then the FDA will approve. And once this is approved in the, uh, by the FDA in the US, the advisory committee on immunization practices will then make guidelines you know, to whom and how these vaccines will be will be used. And so the ACIP will release their uh, recommendation as to the use of these vaccines. So these vaccines will then now be marketed. You know, so and then so this will be distributed to uh, different uh, places, different countries. And then once these vaccines are already uh, marketed and used in different individuals, continuous monitoring of the possible adverse reaction is also still done. You know? So safety monitoring for serious and unexpected adverse events are also done in the phase four of the uh, vaccine development. So post monitoring, uh, post approval monitoring and research are, are being done uh, in the different countries. So this will, this will show you, you know, a different illustration of the number of people that's involved in the different phases of uh, vaccine trials. So for the phase one, only about 20 to 100. So in the phase two, there are more people that's uh, being tested, uh, given the vaccine to, and then the, for the phase three, there, is, uh, there are more hundreds of thousands of people. And then for the, uh, after the phase three, once it's approved, then it's used for the for everyone that uh, the vaccine is recommended to. So, what is emergency use authorization? So, a medical a medical product or a vaccine is made available before a full application is approved by the FDA. Just like what happened to the COVID vaccine, because we cannot wait uh, anymore for the phase three trial to finish, which will take about five to seven years from clinical phase uh, from phase one to to phase three that will take about seven years so we cannot wait for that uh, duration to be able to make use of the vaccine so maybe by then by that time many the uh, mortality would really have uh, risen and many individuals will be infected uh, with the virus and the healthcare community will really be uh, overwhelmed with this uh, the number of individuals being affected. So to receive an authorization for emergency use, vaccine developers must demonstrate that the vaccine's known or potential benefit outweighs the known and potential risks. So this is not a lower standard, but a more tailored, 
flexible standard that helps protect those who need it most while more evidence is generated needed to make the public confident about getting a COVID vaccine. So this is um, a different uh, illustration of the uh, vaccine development. No? So you will see in the research uh, period, it will take two to four years for the preclinical pre studies that takes one to two years. For the phase one, that will take five to seven years. You know, and then it's being approved. And then so it's going to be manufactured by the company. There's also marketing and administration. That's, so that's the phase four uh, of the vaccine development. But for the pandemic accelerated model, so this is what happens. No? So it's research was, was done uh, at the start when they noted the virus. And then there was preclinical trial already. And then while the preclinical trial was still ongoing, they already started with the phase one trial. So they did the, they started it with the healthy individuals and then they proceeded to give it to uh, vulnerable individuals and then the phase three. So while they were still in the phase two or three, manufacturing was already started. So that when the result will come out, then it's already ready for distribution to the different countries. So there's administration and then there's also phase four of the trial while uh, manufacturing and distribution of the vaccine is uh, done. So this is an, uh, an illustration of the different vaccines. Maybe we will not go to just to emphasize that uh, RNA based is for Pfizer and Moderna. And then we have the Sinovac which is a one, the one available in Cagayan de Oro, which is an inactivated uh, virus. No? So the, this, this is a killed pathogen that cannot replicate itself. So we will now go to the different, uh, to the individual vaccines. No? So we first discussed the, the Moderna, no? which is an RNA uh, vaccine. And then the, the, this is given in two doses and it's given intramuscularly. So the dose interval is uh, 28 days between the first and the second dose. So the difficulty with this, it is needs to be stored in a freezer of at negative 25 to 15 degrees. No? So and this is not available in Cagayan de Oro. So uh, the plan when the Pfizer vaccine will uh, arrive in the Philippines was to give it to Manila, Davao, and Cebu because this is the, these are the places where uh, freezer that can um, store the vaccine at these temperatures are available. So the study was, uh, the clinical trial was started in July of last year for the Moderna and there were, in their clinical trial, they enrolled 30,000 uh, individuals. No? So 15,000 were given the vaccine and then 15 were also given the placebo. So this was given to adults 18 years and older, and uh, there were 47.4% females, and there were also individuals more than 65 years old uh, who were given the vaccine. So 82% were considered at occupational risk for SARS-CoV-2, so like the healthcare workers. So uh, the result of their trial showed a vaccine efficacy no, of 94.1 percent no, occurring at least 14 days after the second dose of the vaccine. So that means that uh, for those who are uh, put, who's going to be potentially infected with the vaccine, for example, if you have nine, 100 individuals, so you will uh, prevent you know, 94 to have the uh, uh, infection you know, against giving nothing to, to these individuals and they will experience the infection. Next is the Pfizer vaccine, no? so which is also an mRNA vaccine, also given for two doses, but the interval is 21 days. It's also given intramuscularly, but the storage is even at a lower temperature, no? so that's negative 70 degrees. And um, it is uh, stored at two to eight degrees for five days once uh, thawed but uh, undiluted. So the Pfizer 
uh, trial enrolled 43,000 uh, participants. And so there were 18,000 who were given the vaccine and also 18,000 given the placebo. So this was given to adults 16 years old and above who were healthy or with stable comorbids, even including those who have HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. So the vaccine efficacy of Pfizer was at 95%. So for the AstraZeneca, no, which is um, an inactivated vaccine, no, so it is, uh, it's uh, the use of the adenovirus for, for the AstraZeneca. And so they, uh, the vaccine is given also for two doses and the interval is between six to 12 weeks. And they have said that those who are given a longer duration interval uh, confers better uh, immunogenicity. So it's also given intramuscularly. And um, so there has been uh, no EUA approval in the UK and the US, but they already submitted for approval in the Philippines. So we have the uh, AstraZeneca, which enrolled 7,000 uh, participants. No? And this was uh, also given to greater than 18 years old no? who with higher risk of exposure to the virus, including healthcare workers. No? So their vaccine efficacy is at 70.4%. So for the um, Gamaleya, a vaccine which is from Russia. So they also have, uh, it's also given intramuscularly and it, uh, the storage is only at two to eight degrees centigrade. So it's also given uh, for two doses. And um, the efficacy you know, of the vaccine you know, is at 91.6%. So just like the other vaccines, no, the, the common uh, local uh, effects of the vaccine is really pain on the injection site. There may be swelling and some patients may even have fever, but that's only a short time. Now we have the Novavax, no, which is a recombinant subunit. They make use of the spike protein. We mentioned that they only, some vaccines make use of uh, subunit only of the of the virus. So it's also given for two doses, uh, 21 days apart. So better storage uh, requirement at two to eight degrees centigrade. And the, the they have not uh, released their data on the vaccine efficacy of Novavax. So it's still uh, in the phase one and two of their clinical trial. So we have the Sinovac, no, which is the one that's going to be available for Cagayan de Oro, which is an inactivated virus. It's also given in two doses, given intramuscularly, and then the interval is between 14 to 28 days. No, so storage uh, requirement is also better at two to eight degrees centigrade. So that's the usual storage requirement that we have for, for most vaccines. And um, the efficacy of this um, uh, vaccine, no? the, the, their data is still really not out, but some, some uh, journals have said that the efficacy is between 50 to, to 60 for, for this vaccine. And the uh, reactogenicity is also experienced, uh, percent uh, being pain and swelling in the injection site or they may all, we also may note discoloration or redness or even pruritus. And some patients may also present with systemic uh, effects of the vaccine. Uh, this is a table you know, comparing the different uh, um, vaccines and their vaccine efficacies. So for the, this is from, taken from another uh, journal. This is from the WHO. So for the Sinovac, no, so this is still in phase three, 
and data is not yet published that the report efficacy is at 50% for mild, 78% for mild to severe in Brazil and 65% vaccine efficacy in Indonesia and 91.25% vaccine efficacy in the study done in Turkey. So what are the adverse reactions to vaccines? So we have the reactogenic reaction, which is an inflammatory response that occurs after vaccination. So it occurs within the first three days after vaccination and resolves within the one to three days after the onset of the reaction. So reactions like pain, swelling, and tenderness on injection site are noted. And patients may also manifest systemic reactions which is an effect of the release of inflammatory mediators as a reaction of the body to an invader, you know, which is actually the vaccine or a foreign body, again, uh, that's being injected into the body. So this may be seen as headache, fatigue, malaise, muscle pain, chills, fever, and vomiting. So we also have the allergic reaction, you know, which is an exaggerated immune response to a usually harmless substance. So there's one uh, types one to four allergic reaction. So type one is the reaction that can manifest as urticaria, vomiting, abdominal cramps, rhinitis, and asthma, which can happen within four hours after exposure to an allergen. So anaphylaxis, uh, which is the severe type of type one reaction, is rare. And for mRNA vaccine, it is noted at 11.1 per million dose so it's not really very high but yeah we have that's the reason why we have seen some some reports of people having these reactions when they were given the mrna vaccines and they can also manifest as pruritus or dicaria flushing and your angioedema dyspnea wheezing vomiting abdominal cramps syncope and hypotension and tachycardia or increase in the heart rate So type 2 reaction can manifest as also as anemia you know, or thrombocytopenia, which may be noted later you know, where after the injection of the vaccine. And anaphylaxis should be managed with epinephrine. You know, that's the reason why uh, it is recommended for, for vaccination sites to have epinephrine ready, and they have to observe the, those who have been injected with the vaccine for at least 30 minutes to an hour after the vaccination. So having all these um, vaccines that's going to be available to us, you know, uh, it's still important to make use of the other interventions to protect ourselves. You know? So this is the Swiss cheese um, uh, criteria, or no, the, the uh, interventions you know, that we can that we have in place that we have to put in place to protect ourselves so we have to exercise still the physical distancing having a good ventilation in the areas where we stay still wearing of mask and hand hygiene and surface cleaning and then testing of those who have been exposed or those with symptoms and then to isolate and quarantine those with the a disease or those who have been uh, uh, exposed, then of course the government uh, intervention should still be in place. And then we have the last, which is the vaccine. So even if we are already vaccinated, uh, the experts still recommend that we have to still exercise the minimum uh, health standard, which is the wearing of masks, hand hygiene, and the wearing of face shields. So I would like to end with uh, what Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, no, the WHO G Director General said in one of his uh, press conferences. He said, vaccines will help to save lives, but if countries rely solely on vaccines, they're making a mistake. So basic public health measures remain the foundation of the response to the pandemic. Thank you and good morning. Again, kayong salamat, um, Doc Arlene, no, for again uh, strengthening our knowledge and our deeper understanding on the vaccines that are available and our the, the reactions that uh, may be possible as we proceed with the vaccination program. So uh, now is the time for our uh, open forum. 
Um, but many of the questions that are that were raised again uh, when we pre-registered, uh, most of these questions have already been answered uh, from the presentations of uh, our two speakers. So, but there are some uh, here um, that are uh, that would need further um, explanations. One coming from um, Judge Borja, uh, he said uh, there's a 50% uh, e efficacy effectiveness of Sinovac. Does it mean uh, it works only 50% of the time or that it works only up to 50% of the range of symptoms? So I think Dr. Gina wanted to answer this earlier. So any of the two uh, can maybe uh, uh, answer this. Actually, Dr. Opsioma was uh, including it in her, ano, in her lecture. No? Katobit ang mga data on, on pila kabuok ang population na gi, gi, ano the test but anyway let me flash something on the screen uh, wait. share sorry am i sorry do you see anything we see you. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. I, I'm always not. I'm not good at this. No. Ah, wait. I'm. I'm lost. Sorry. Share screen. Oh, there you go. Hola. Share. Okay. So I think. Can you see the? Yes, no, no, no. Can you see the slide? Okay. So on my no. Uh, okay. Basically, a uh, part of the part of the trials. No, Rem you remember Doc Arlene was talking about phase one, phase two, phase three, and even there's even a phase four trial. No. Um, in phase three, what happens is there is a clinical trial where there is a group that is vaccinated and there is a group that is not vaccinated. So the, the efficacy is actually a comparison of the risk among the unvaccinated group minus the risk among the vaccinated group over the risk among the unvaccinated group. I did not want to go into this because it turns many people off. No? Kanang mag na ganit, mathematics, di na gusto maminaw ang mga tao. So 96% uh, efficacy rate means the vaccine reduces the risk of having disease by 96% in the vaccinated group compared to the non-vaccinated group. So this is efficacy. How it will behave in, in a real situation when it is used in the community is everybody's guess. Kung maupapagihapune ang, ang efficacy, we don't know. No? If, uh, effectiveness, we don't know. Right now, that nobody, no pharma company can answer effectiveness rate because there is not enough data. Um, what, ev what everybody needs to understand is that when, when the pandemic hit us, the, all the research that had to go with the development of a vaccine actually was cut short, no? Shortcut shatanan. So wala. There are many things we cannot answer, and it is that, no? It is you take it or you leave it. Kasi wala yoy tubag ang daghang pangutana ani, because we are. Uh, Doc Arlene again mentioned this later, uh, earlier. If this were a normal research, it will take between five to seven years. No? So right now, if I ask you, if I ask people when do we get the, the next round of the vaccine no because like like for example flu vaccine we have it every year diba ang coron ang, ang ang coronavirus vaccine ba every year gihapon nobody will be able to answer you that because we don't know what is going to happen is enough, if enough people are vaccinated um Later on, people will have to submit to a to a tighter, no, um, 
the titer of antibodies will have to be determined and then experts will tell us whether we need the vaccine again or not. So uh, this is just what I want to, the, the, the end, the, what the takeaway message is, there is nothing really very, very sure yet, no, except for the fact that most of the vaccines that have been given EUA are at least effective in first preventing the disease or preventing the severe form of the disease so that we can get the disease on, in a mild uh, version and so we do not die. Uh, Attorney Borja actually had a question related to that. No? Uh, let me just stop sharing. Okay, I forgot. <laughs> Attorney Borja, can you ask the question again? I It's not on my screen anymore. You had a question about herd immunity and... Uh, he had a question about, I know, about, will it affect yeah, herd, herd immunity? No, uh, mm, is not that. That will I, it affect I, herd immunity? Doc yeah. Borja, would you... My related I, judge question... Judge my related question is, <clears throat> I think there is no question that the vaccine can provide individual immunity, but the reports from media are, are saying that it may protect you from getting the severe symptoms severe of the disease, disease yes. but yes. you may remain a carrier and therefore may be able to yes. transmit it. Yes. It suggests to me, I'm a layman here, no? It suggests to me that it, it definitely works on an individual basis, but may not be, may not induce a herd immunity because we can still transmit it. And everyone who may be immune individually may still be a carrier and transmit it. At least that's what CNN and the other news, uh, BBC and the others are reporting. If that is true, how does that affect herd immunity? It does not mean I don't want it, no, but I'm just, just curious how it will affect the general community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Exactly. Exactly. No, exactly. That's why, again, this is one of the unanswered and the impossible to answer questions. When we are asked, when do we achieve herd immunity? I will really tell you I don't know because Exactly. The point of Attorney Borja is, of Judge Borja is that uh, if the vaccine prevents only the severe form of disease, therefore, I can, even if I'm vaccinated, I can still transmit and, and in fact, I can still get sick of the disease, but I will get the milder form. And so, because makatransmit pamangkot, I do not contribute to herd immunity. Exactly. Exactly. Kaya nga, it's difficult to, again, these are things that we, we cannot answer in, in exactly, no? Anang dili, dili, dili taka makumpyutan, dili ka makumpyutan din he, unya, makasulti ko sa imo nga by one year or by two years, ma-achieve ma na nato ang herd immunity. But certainly, I am having myself vaccinated because I think, it is better to protect myself than not to protect myself. Nakaantos naman tag more than a year nga walay protection. So, bisag 50% efficacy, I will submit to it. No, I will submit to it. Okay. Thank yeah, better you. than Thank none. You. Mayo na lang na kaysa wala. Sige. Thank you, Doc Gina. Doc Arlene, would you like to add in something to, that, uh, to the answer of Doc Gina? Yeah. Uh, well, it's true, no? Uh, I, I'm not sure if I got uh, Judge Borja right when he said that there is a concern of becoming a career after, is this after being vaccinated? Career of the virus after being infected? Not sure if that's if that what he meant. No, but I think um, 
that's not true no that you will the individual will remain a career of the virus because as was mentioned in the lecture the viral shedding will start to decline even on the first day when the symptoms happen and then so it ends as was uh, uh, seen in the different trials the isolation of the virus usually does not happen anymore after eight days from the onset of un of symptoms. So I don't think the, the question of uh, uh, being a career has really a basis. No? And then I agree with Dr. Rajina no, that it's really better to, to be protected from developing the severe disease. No? So if you are one of those who see these patients with severe infections and you see these patients every day, you would really want people not to experience this. No? So if there's a vaccine that can be given to prevent people from developing these severe infections, then for me, that would really be good. You know, because if you will still have the infection, but just have the mild disease, that's just like an ordinary flu, then that's really okay. So even if, that's why we also mentioned earlier on that even with the vaccines and all that we have, we still have to institute the minimum health standards that so it should still be in place. We should still make a uh, use mask, wear our face shields, wash our hands, no? Because as Dr. Jean has mentioned, many questions are still being answered by different studies, no? So we still have to learn many things, but uh, while we wait for all this information and there's this data, then we have to practice these minimum health standards to protect ourselves still. Okay. Thank you, Doc Arlene. Uh, so Thank I think uh, the answers are very clear. Uh, so maybe we can proceed to the next one. Uh, this one from uh, Sir Bibal. He asks, is it possible that some persons have already developed antibodies against COVID virus? So for example, he said, I have natural antibodies against hepatitis, so I was not vaccinated for hepatitis. A test was conducted before immunization. So is it possible? Yeah, uh, yes, it is possible. Our body will develop antibodies yes. only when it is exposed to a, an antigen. So we, when you have an antibody against the hepatitis, even if you were not immunized, that means you have been infected at some point in the past. But your immune system was able to fight the virus, so you have now your antibody. So it is, yeah, possible for individuals to have antibodies against the, the, coronavirus, uh, uh, the coronavirus when you get infected. And we have uh, mentioned that there are asymptomatic individuals, so we really do not know. No? So that's why there's a question whether should we uh, screen all individuals if they have antibodies, and then after the screening, should we just uh, give the vaccine to those who have not been exposed or who have, who have not been immunized. But that will really take time because there's still that will uh, entail cost of the testing for the antibodies. And then that will take grabby and logistics and all. So it will delay even more the giving of the vaccine. So there's really no concern if you have had a previous infection no, at, at present they say even if you have had infection then you may still be given the vaccine so it's really still safe no if you have had an infection in the past no if you have uh, a symptomatic infection and then you are given the vaccine so so studies have shown that that's really still okay no, to give the vaccine to these individuals okay Thank you very much. Uh, to just to manage time, uh, maybe one or two more questions. Um, some can be collapsed. Many of the questions that are here are really are asking about the adverse effects of, of the vaccine no? once one is subjected to the vaccination. So that was answered in the presentation of uh, Dr. Arlene uh, earlier. So here lang are, are some of the questions that are still being raised. Um, my mother is um, undergoing cancer treatment. Would you advise her to get vaccinated? And is there a need for an assessment of a patient's health status before uh, the vaccination? So either Dr. Gina or um, Dr. Arlene may answer the question. Uh, okay, I'll answer. For the first question, 
uh, it's best for the attending physician of the patient to really assess whether it's safe, no, because it's not uh, right and it's not easy, no, to just say uh, I have a patient, I have a mother with uh, cancer, and then can she be immunized? Because the doctor really has to assess. No, there are there may be still tests to be done to really assess if the it's really safe for the patient to be given the vaccine. So for the second question, yes, the DOH, I, I think, has a, a pre-assessment uh, assessment form prior to immunization. So all individuals should be assessed uh, their health status first prior to giving the vaccine because we need to know whether they have uh, comorbidity whether they have allergies, history of allergies. So this has to be done prior to the immunization. Yeah, Doc Gina, would you have something to add to Doc Arlene's uh, answer? Thank you, Doc Arlene. I was about, I was about to ask also, <laughs> to ask her also. I told her I will <laughs> ask her because I have a brother who is immunocompromised, no? who is taking tacrolimus because of, of yeah. kidney transplant. Which which type of vaccine would you recommend that he gets? I I remember reading somewhere and I don't remember now. Nasi lagi like recommend para sa ano sa sa inaning a paciente no immunocompromised. One of the vaccines you talked about, I I can't recall anymore which one it was that uh, they were recommending that he gets. Do you, do you have an answer to it? Yeah, the, 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 in the presentation, it was mentioned that uh, in the Pfizer trial, they included some immunocompromised individuals, those with HIV. Immunocompromised, yeah. Okay. So uh, I think it's the Pfizer, but for the, the Pfizer activated, Pfizer. Though, activated was um, in immunocompromised, the concern really is if their immune uh, system is not good, and then they have, they will be given the live. No, vac uh, vaccine, then this might okay, cause yeah. uh, severe infection in this individual. But if it's infection, killed yes. or inactivated, then it should be safe to give to these individuals. And the problem only with those with uh, immunosuppressants is the question of whether their immune system will really be able to mount a good response against this, this uh, vaccine. Yes. So that still has to be answered uh, by the different studies, though. Yes. Okay. Actually, nobody could, nobody could give me a straight answer. No. But <laughs> again, it's something that, it's something that we we still do not know the the exact answer to. So, but basing on on literature, there have in Singapore, for example, they have given uh, Sinovac to to patients who have undergone kidney transplant and they were they were okay you know? nothing happened to them yeah Sige, so maybe Dr. Gina, that is also one among the many things that are left uh, unanswered at this time no? uh, uh, in the development of the current uh, available vaccines in the market so sige, that, that is uh, one among those. So thank you very much. No? Uh, si, uh, Judge Borja has another question and many of the questions that were raised actually uh, were in terms of like, uh, is, the, is there a vaccination program in XU? Uh, do the employees get the vaccine for free and things like that? Uh, but the doctors, our resource persons will not answer that anymore. That will be left to our uh, kind of closing message by our uh, VP, uh, Sasoy later. So, so uh, that one, the next uh, steps for XU to take maybe, and, and these um, questions on how employees and even students uh, will be able to avail of, of this um, will be answered. So um, there might be other questions that are not yet answered here, but um, we can raise this again with you, Doc Gina and Doc Arlene, through email and other forms of uh, communication and, and social media. And then we will get this uh, back to you, to the, the, the ones who asked the question uh, for maybe possible answers. But if there are no answers yet at the moment, then 
that's just it. We will still say it's not yet uh, possible to answer the question. So thank you very much. Uh, Doc Gina and Doc Arlene, uh, si Sir Ed Sasoy will also, on behalf of uh, XU, uh, will thank you officially after he uh, delivers his closing message and the immediate next steps for, for Xavier University. So can we all give Doc Gina and, and Doc Arlene of Shoma a virtual round of applause? Oh, happy birthday, Doc Arlene. <laughs> it's her birthday. Have a COVID-free birthday, Dr. Arlene. Okay. So, uh, Sir Ed Sasoy, our VP for administration, will now give uh, the closing message and again, uh, the next steps uh, for XU to take in this uh, vaccination plan. No? So, thank you. Um, Sir Ed? Yes. Uh, thank you, Gail. So, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Uh, no? Uduna. Thank you for attending our first COVID-19 vaccination webinar. Since the expected arrival of the vaccines will be at the third quarter of this year, we will continue to provide venues like this so we can all be informed of new developments related to our vaccination program and, of course, the availability of vaccines. To succeed in our fight against COVID-19, we have to have the same shared objective of achieving herd immunity as emphasized by Doc Gina and Doc Arlene in their presentations. Our way of proceeding will be including the following activities. No? First, uh, I'd like to request that uh, all unit heads will perform or conduct a unit level discussion of vaccination concerns. Units, for example, like PPO, CISO, basic ed, as well as higher ed units uh, to meet and discuss individual concerns about the vaccination to resolve individual concerns like doubts, for example, or hesitations about individuals getting vaccinated. We will give ample time for the units to do this. I would like to request the concerns not resolved during these meetings be cascaded to the committee for possible resolution. Second, we will conduct an online survey to get the community's polls in, uh, on the probable issues and concerns that hinders the acceptance of vaccination. From the result, we will provide targeted infographics to provide more information addressing majority of these concerns. We will also provide FAQs, no? uh, both videos and text, and post them in our websites for everyone to see and read. Third, we will also constantly update everyone on new developments, for example, new vaccines on phase three trials, uh, vaccines given EUA or emergency use authorization in the Philippines, and promising vaccines no, being developed that XU can probably order no, in the near future and use uh, for our program. Fourth, the committee will also find ways of enhancing this vaccination program considering the resources of the university and employees. No? Uh, there is a question kung makahatag ba for free. No? Uh, I hope makahatag for free, but uh, nato sa tayo problema no? sa ito ang panudlanan. Uh, the committee will explore creative ways no? of trying to fund our vaccination program. So at this point, I would like to thank our resource speakers for their time and effort to address the learning needs of the XU community about this very important endeavor. Doc Gina and Doc Arlene, thank you very much. The Social Development Cluster also for hosting this webinar headed by VP Ruel Ravanera, of course, Gail, uh, Becky, and the SB team, no? and also the members of the committee who helped in making this webinar a success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Ed, uh, our VP Ed Sasoy, thank you. So again, uh, vaccination is important to attain herd or community immunity against the virus. The more people get vaccinated, the more barriers for the virus to get transmitted and eventually will help end the pandemic. So basic prevention, health prevention and protection is still highly advised. No, uh, Better get the vaccine, according to Doc Jojo, better get the vaccine than get the virus. <laughs> Sige, hopefully, uh, atinista, pabakuna ta, uh, let us uh, continue on with uh, the vaccination program that gets strengthened as what uh, Sir Ed uh, earlier said. So 
uh, kamulo pang gipanday gihapon ang pag-strengthen sa vaccination program for Savior. So hopefully, again, this is not the first um, uh, webinar that will tackle this, but uh, there will be other webinars as well. So thank you very much, everyone.